Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Gospel Life Church. My name is Kayla. I want to invite you to stand as we worship together this morning. Put those hands together. We join our voices together to worship our King. Let's sing this out. a sea of voices we are an ocean of your praise gathered under one name we are a tide that's rising and we cannot be contained gathered under sin was slain gathered under one name where every chain is broken and every sorrow swept away gathered under Proclaim his name. Let's sing it out. With all heaven sing and all earth below. One holy king, one highest throne. With all heaven sing and all earth below. One holy to worship together this morning.
those hands together. That is good news this morning. Before you take your seats, why don't you turn to somebody next to you, in front of you, behind you, say good morning, give them a high five, spread the energy, spread the love. Good morning. Oh, that's not good. I need I need a good morning. Oh, that's great. That's better. Thank you. How are you guys doing today? Oh, all right. I like that. I got a thumbs up. I like it. Hey, so I just want to welcome you to Gospel Life. My name is Renee Cross. Uh, if you're new here or if you're new but you haven't really met anybody yet, I want to encourage you just to take a minute to, I say a minute, it's five minutes. Take five minutes to stop by Take 5 in the corner over here and just get to, you know, meet the people of the church and we get to meet you and find out about, you know, any maybe answer some questions that you may have about the church and maybe you're interested in getting involved or looking in a small group, whatever it is, we'll be able to kind of help you out there and get you started. So um, also, I don't know if you guys remember, I'm pulling this out of my pocket. You guys remember these little things? What are they? Yeah, they're the memory verses for Romans. So um, I want to encourage you guys, if you haven't picked them up, to pick them up. Or if you've picked them up, but they're somewhere in your house, find them. Because this is a great way for us to just really start memorizing the word. Plus, helps you keep connected with the service as well. My small group is doing it, so we were like memorizing it. And then we'd say to each other, be like, what? What? What is it? What is it again? So we're working on it as a group. So that's a great way, too, if you're like, if you're more group oriented, you can work that way. So also, you know how they have the men's breakfast, right, for you men, which I'm not, you know, just fine. Got something for y'all men. But I want to tell you women, we're having something, too. Woo, woo, woo. So I have a bunch of themes that I told the group this morning. I have a bunch of themes. I don't know what theme we're going to end up with, but we're going to have breakfast. Let me just say that. For breakfast on February 10th from 9 to 11, and it will be here. Uh, we'll send out like an invite so then you got more information. And if you have any questions or you want to help out, guess what? We could, you know, reach out to me or to Sam and just ask, and we'll, you know, be able to answer any questions that you have. And if you want to help out, I got plenty to do. There's great decorating stuff out there. So, woohoo! Yeah, I like that. Yeah, thank you. These guys are great in the front. I need more of that. Uh, so, the uh, last thing I want to just share is our uh, my small group um, is, uh, you know, we have Sam in our small group, and she started out with us, and she's been in and out just due to everything that's been going on, and so if you're not aware, Sam has um, breast cancer, and so it's been a, a real big, you know, um, not struggle, but just a, a, it's been a journey. Let me just say that. It's been a journey, and so what we've decided to do in our small group is we're going to so this upcoming Tuesday, I don't know if you guys remember, they're going to go to Ohio, and they're going to have a um, meet with a specialist and just kind of hear, like, what are the next steps? You know, what do we do? And they're looking for wisdom. So Tuesday, our, our small group is going to, we're going to fast, and we're just going to bring it to the Lord and just, we're going to walk alongside him in that way. So I want to invite you guys to also fast with us if you want, and you're like, fast, I cannot give up food. It's okay, and you might not be able to give up food for medical reasons or whatever, but there are other things you can do. Give up your technology. I was like, as a matter of fact, where is mine? I have no idea. So, but technology, TV, whatever it is that you find that kind of keeps you, you know, focused and you're looking at all the time, take some time and give that up on Tuesday. And let's just really storm the, you know, heaven with just our prayers and requests that God would give them, you know, next steps in wisdom. Okay. So join us in doing that. And if you have any questions, you can always reach out to me as well. And I can walk you through some thoughts and ideas. Uh, and now I just want to say this service is full. Woo-hoo! Look at that. I only see a few seats. I love it, which means that maybe someday, and Pastor Tay is like, don't say this for name, but <laughs> he's like, great, now what is she doing? But maybe we might have to have a third service. Sorry. I know you guys are like, what? 
<laughs> Sorry. But maybe we might have to have a third service. Wouldn't that be awesome? You know, just, you know what? You don't know what the Lord's going to do, right? So exciting, exciting times. So um, we had our business meeting last week and talked about 2024 and what's ahead and what's happening. So who knows what's ahead, folks? Well, we know. We kind of have an idea from the business meeting. But Pastor Tay is going to talk a little bit about that uh, when he comes up, just kind of some follow-up things uh, that we're uh, asking about. And so you'll get more information on that. But I just want to say thank you for your service, for serving. Thank you for, um, you know, your ties. Thank you for all that you do in loving this church. And when I look around, there are so many people I don't know. And I'm like, I don't know that person. I love that. I love that I don't know somebody because I'm going to come find you. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, everybody's nervous now. Um, but just, you know, I want to know who you are. And we, we just it's been amazing to see this grow. And the community as well. People are coming from all over the community. So I want to thank you for that. And I just want to take a moment just to pray uh, before we continue on. Dear Lord, I just thank you so much for all that you've done here in this church, God. Without you, we couldn't have done anything. And so, Father, we're excited about what is ahead and what you have planned for us. I thank you for all the hands and feet that have been a part of this, Father God. It's just a blessing. And I pray, Father, as we continue to journey on this year, God, that you would just surprise us in ways that uh, we would have never thought. And, Father, I just pray over Pastor Tay as he comes up here. I pray that you, through him, would just speak to us, God, and speak to our hearts. Meet us where we're at. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Renee. Uh, we are excited this week to bring a new song to all of you. It's called Holy Forever. If you guys uh, listen to the radio or get into the Christian music spheres, you may have heard it. Um, but before we enter into that, we are going to take the next four weeks um, as a congregation in diving into Romans chapter 8. Um, it's a big chapter. There's a lot of really rich um, things happening, and so Pastor Tay and others are going to uh, preach through that over the next four weeks. And so as we enter into that, we um, have put together this uh, responsive reading, which takes excerpts from different portions of Romans chapter 8 that we're going to read together to sort of set our intention for our time together um, for the rest of this series and for, for before we uh, proclaim this song out together. Does that sound good to you all? All right, let's stand and we'll read. I'll read the leader portion and you read the people. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The spirit of life has set us free in Christ Jesus. Walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the spirit set their lives on the basis of the spirit. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And we know that for those who live, all things work together for good. If God is for us, who can be against us? Let's sing this chorus together. It goes like this. And the angels cry, holy, all creation cries, holy, you are lifted high, holy, holy forever. Sing that with me. And the angels cry. Holy, all creation cries. Holy, you are lifted high. Holy, holy forever. Great, you sound amazing. Let's continue as we sing this song together. and generations falling down and worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all have gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of 
God, we do cry out to you this morning that you are holy, that you are faithful, that you are, are so good. We proclaim that you are holy now and that you will be holy forever, Lord. We thank you for the gift that you have given us in your son, Jesus, who went to the, throne, the, the cross, died in our place, and now is seated at the right hand of you, the Father, and in whom we have life and life to the full. God, we cry out to you this morning with what we have, with what we're feeling, with what we know, with what we don't know. God, we bring it before you. And we proclaim that you are holy. You are holy above it all. We thank you, Lord, for this time that we have to proclaim your name. And we ask, God, that you would continue to speak to us, that you would continue to be lifted high, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and tongue confess. So we pray this now in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated and the kids are dismissed. Thank you so much to our worship team. Thank you and to you lifting your voice, all of God's people. It sounds so good worshiping our Lord. And someday we have a promise and guarantee that that will be us in heaven around the throne, worshiping him forever and ever. How we made it over. Oh, what joy it is going to be. I am uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to see you and be in the house of the Lord. Let me tell you, we've seen God uh, real life answer prayers this, this morning. This morning, uh, I said to the team when I got here, I do not want to be here. As a pastor, I don't want to be here. Uh, this week, I think it was time and time again where we caught ourselves in the corner crying and fearful of what is absolute next. And it all kind of accumulated last night as we were sitting there, and I'm reading through Romans chapter 8 to finally continue to prepare for today and get my mind around the text. And the Lord says, you will have purpose in suffering. As I've endured it, you've endured it too. It's, I didn't want to be here. And so this morning, I got up with not knowing how I was going to preach, and we just sought the Lord in prayer, and he has done just as he said, to be our strength in moments of weakness. And so I pray that he does that again. Amen. God alone be praised. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Again, we would not make it through what we're going through. And as you have before, without the people of God praying for you and for us. And so trust in him. We cannot trace him. We got to trust him. And so our hearts are encouraged. Uh, in spite of, in spite of. Romans chapter 8 is where we are going to be, but before we get to Romans chapter 8, I'll give you some time to get there. Uh, last week, as Renee said, we uh, had our annual meeting, uh, an opportunity for you as our church, as church members, to kind of uh, look back with us uh, of last year, 2023, and then look ahead into 2024, and a lot of that, we uh, had um, uh, the budget and talked about staff and things like that. And so it was maybe around 40 of us who stayed. And so from that, we took away some takeaways or some action items. And I want to go and share with us how can we continue to achieve this goal of how do we help people find and follow Jesus for the first time or, or greater uh, in their walks with him. And so uh, there was around 40 of us that, that, that stayed, and then we affirmed, and we talked. And my promise to the congregation uh, was to bring back some of those action items uh, that we will work through and talk through. And so I think one of the cool things you guys voted on, if he wasn't here, is we will have a hot tub when that patio gets done for the summer. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so you get ready. So that's right. No, I'm just saying that your money's not going there. But I, I want to share this with you, and then we'll jump into the text, uh, some takeaways. So uh, one of the things we will continue to do and also begin to explore, we decide to explore two to three new service uh, opportunities, serving opportunities within our community. Outside of what we're already doing with the, with the police uh, and, and um, our ministries here, the local ministry support, uh, it was a desire, and I completely agree, how can we have more opportunities to serve, whether it's with the uh, on-site campus here of COD or the high school or the park district. You know, someone is bringing some detail work back to me from that meeting to how we can get plugged in and serve the community. 
it's a good thing. We got to be about it. I want to be about it. As we know, uh, I can't be about it by myself. Neither can all the people who are serving. So what this does do for us, it gives everybody an opportunity now to take a piece of this pie and serve and let's make a greater impact for the gospel here in this community. So uh, we'll be exploring two to three new partnerships opportunities there. The second is that we have a revised and reinstated plan uh, of deacons in 2024. Uh, In our end report, if you've seen over and over again, at the end of service today, we have some left over. It is available online as well. Uh, We did not put our deacons in our annual report. Uh, One, just even from a bylaw standpoint, is you should have deacons meetings pretty regularly. We have not had a deacons meeting since 2020, so it was like two years or so, now three years. And uh, it would have been dishonest to put the deacons in there. So it kind of rolled that off. But Deacons, of course, when you look in scriptures, both deacons and deaconess, like that office or that servant is open to both men and women, uh, help carry the ministry load for the pastor as well as the church. And so uh, as we talk with, uh, with our organization, as we talk with Scott, uh, what does it look like as we re, um, revisit or revise our, uh, our deacons in here? So uh, really cool opportunity. It, it gives the arms of our church to be so much more extended through men and women to help carry some of the um, some of the load as well. Now, again, is that campus specific? Is that an organizational thing? Those are questions that I will be taking back to talk through. So, uh, next thing, committed to gauging the process regarding one revisions of our elder team structure and a greater representation of our CA. As you know, our elder here is Anthony Monero. He and his family uh, is here today, sitting here on, on this side. Uh, but there's a process to our, el- our eldership. And so that onboarding process, what exactly does that look like? What does the application processing look like? Those are some things where we just wasn't clear on that I'm going back to get answers on. So we all know uh, what we are doing in regards to the leadership of our church. Now, We trust the leaders of our church. We trust those men. They have a biblical call, according to God's word, to hold that office. Uh, But as we sit in different campuses and maybe more to come someday, uh, we want greater representation. So that way, our elders know it's not just Anthony fighting the fight by himself, but, but they know what's going on specifically at our site, specifically within our churches for doctrine, for God, for, for godly health, but also how we better can uh, engage as a congregation and leadership there. And so what does that structure look like? Number four is status on application processes for international mission trips. Uh, Super important. Uh, You know, you think about Ghana. Uh, When we went to Ghana last year, we were there specifically for BBS. Sometimes some of these international mission trips are going to be for a very specific or a concentrated time of serving. Now, you're going to need a tech guy, or you're going to need a person who loves games, or who can teach. And so some of those roles uh, will need to be filled by uh, people who's already serving. However, on the other side of this, where this came in, is I don't dare want to be a pastor who shows any type of favoritism. And so what needs to be this equal playing ground is as we go on these mission trips, right, because, well, it may cost us 2000 to the person who's going, in actuality, it may cost $3,500, $4,000 on our end. And so we want to make sure everyone gets a fair opportunity to do what God is calling them to do and to be stretched for the sake of the kingdom. And so what does that look like? La Paz has one, which that trip is still available. I will, God willing, uh, things continue to go uh, where we are now and hopefully a little better. I will be on the trip March 2nd through the 8th. And so if you do want to go to Mexico... Uh, that trip is available to serve our missionaries there. Sign up, sign up, sign up. Let's get that supported. But what is the application process to that? Is there an interview? Is there an intake? How, again, do we best serve our entire congregation for some of these specific trips? All right. Next, we got uh, seeking additional in- clarification about, I believe, two things here. Number one, our debt repayment plan. So, in, in our uh, annual meeting book, again, which you can get after service or there online, you would see it through our budget, there's assets and there's liabilities, right? Assets are great. Liabilities are like, eh, we probably should start getting rid of these. Right now, we still hold about a liability of about $2.3 million of an existing mortgage over at North Wheaton. With meant for more, uh, with, with a, a um, what's the word I'm looking for? With a... Uh, uh, with one of the parts, that's not the word I'm looking for, with one of the objectives of Mifra Moore is to build a build at North Wheaton. With that, as we know, will come an additional debt. Now, as we are trying to do ministry, some of the things that limit us to do ministry 
is dead. And so we want to try, not that we are there in that situation now, but before we get there years down, down the road is what is the process now to continue to eliminate this debt? And our elders have been praying through that, talked through that. However, we just want to make some of those things known to our, to our people, right? And I say that because you all work 50, 60, 70, 80, maybe 100 or 200 hours a week, and then you come and you follow the command of giving a tithe to the church, tithe and offering for the ongoing work of the ministry. And we use those funds as good stewards, but then also debt has occurred. And so what is the repayment plan for long-term growth? But also, literally, we want to see that debt begin to be knocked down, all right? Uh, and then the la- uh, last one there, meant for more million dollars to mission disbursement. Um, over the next three years, we've said this within meant for more, we want to give a million dollars to mission. The language we've been using, you know, we're doubling that commitment. As you do the math, sometimes the math ain't mathing. And so we want to bring some clarification around how specifically we reach and attain achieving that goal of a million dollars to mission. And so that's kind of what we walked away with from our meeting. I am glad it's only six things and not 46 things. And so six things means we're doing good. Uh, we, are, we are healthy. We're moving forward. And you, as the people of God, have spoke and encouraged the things that are going good, things we need clarity on, and then the challenges that we may face for greater impact of people finding and following Jesus. And so I say this, this is super important. And I cannot, uh, on good conscience, be a good shepherd, a good pastor, if I don't take those takeaways and then put action to them. And so my actions is between 30 to 60 days, right? Here's my action plan I used to do in business. Within 30 to 60 days, 60 days being the max, I'm going to get us some answers to all four of those things. Now, it may be some to-do lists or some to-do steps come out of that. I don't know who's going to do that, how we'll divvy that up, but at least to get some answers to those six things, and then we'll dive down to how we will achieve conquering and getting those things done. That good? Yeah. All right. Again, I want to be open and honest. Uh, every soul, every person in here has another soul attached to it, and, that, and what I mean by that is as you stick and stay and love your church, you then invite someone else to stick and stay and love their church, and it's a greater opportunity for gospel impact. On the other side of that, if any of you leave there's another opportunity for a soul to never come into our church. And so as pastors, we have to be super honest and open and be accountable to an opportunity to see God do his best work through his people. And that cannot be done without the people. So uh, that's my commitment to, uh, to us as God people. All right. Romans chapter eight. Romans chapter eight is where we're going to be. Uh, and over the next few weeks, as Kayla has said, you get to this chapter and it is just full of It is, I mean, a buffet of everything, uh, of of what God, of who God is and who we are in him. And so let's develop that thought over the next couple of minutes we have here. I really want to say over the next couple of hours, because you can preach the first four verses for for two, three hours, but uh, I'll be uh, honest with our time. But uh, Sam and I had been to one hockey game when I worked in Bankhead. We had all these tickets. We went to one hockey game. It was great. Blackhawks, the first moment they start with the national anthem. And the crowd goes crazy. They're singing. I mean, they're cheering because this guy is singing in this operatic voice. Oh, it's great. They drop the puck. Within two minutes in a regulation, they are scrapping. I'm like, oh, man, this is Chicago for you. Fast forward. Uh, uh, January 24th, so uh, three days ago, four days ago, uh, the Florida Panthers is playing the Arizona Coyotes. Any uh, hockey fans in the house? Any NHLers? Yeah, Greensboro. Who else? Oh, Oh, man, that's it. All right. Sorry, right. we had a lot. Oh, there we go, Mike. We had a lot more first service. But so at this game, uh, they dropped the puck. This is on the 20, 24th. Florida Panthers, uh, Arizona Coyotes. They are playing, catch this, within seven seconds of the game, two fights break out. <laughs> and seven seconds of the puck drop. And they are going crazy. I mean, they are sizing each other up, hooking and juking. I mean, someone gets bleeding. Then the next gloves drop and they drop it. And it's so cool because the refs let them go until, you know, someone gets, uh, try not to get hurt. But I, but I think about that picture because last week we talked about Romans 7. And in Romans 7, Paul kept saying there is always this fight between where you are now and the flesh. And how the flesh over and over and over again wants to put his dukes up and fight you to the death and win. 
And it seemed like the first moment you take forward, that's when the flesh gets in the way and wants to fight. And so I thought about that picture. It was like, this is a perfect picture of Romans 7. Because we talked about how sin always wants to control, fight, have power over our lives. And the desires that we repeatedly get into this cycle of the flesh and that struggle to step out of that, it's a real struggle. It is a fight every day for you and I as believers of God. We also saw how Paul kept talking about in that fight, you see, the law is good. But it wasn't the right thing to overcome sin and death that comes through our disobedience to him. And so what Paul basically said that the law only condemns us, although it's good, it only condemns us and tell us every time how we do not hit the mark. But it does not declare us righteous. It does not uh, declare us complete. And the thing that Paul keeps saying over and over again is that it is only in Christ that we've been released from this fight over and over again, not from the, the presence of it or the influence of it, but from the power of it. We have been released from it, and we are dead to the law, and we are made alive in Christ. I tell you that story and that illustration because we get to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 is literally one of the most powerful passages in scriptures, maybe when you came to faith, someone took you through the Romans road, or as you continue to go through your faith, you go back to Romans 8 over and over again. Romans 8 is literally one of the most powerful passages in scripture. And up until this point, Paul, through our time of study in Romans, he hasn't highlighted much of the work of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life. But in this next great text that we're going to dive through over the next couple of weeks alone, I believe perhaps it is the, the highest peak among the spiritual heights that the apostle ever visited. Because what he does now, he talks about the role of the Holy Spirit in applying saving work of Christ through his justification to us. What Paul does next, he talks about this role of the Spirit in applying the saving work of Christ in justification. Now, we talked about justification several times before, but I'll give you a definition here in just a moment of what that means. But Paul now really pins so beautifully of how our union with Christ not only justifies us, but provides for us kind of this indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. That's a good thing. Because in chapter 8, Paul gives kind of this panoramic view. Imagine if you go out on vacation and on the balcony view, you get to see both the city, the trees, and the mountaintops. And you open up the doors and you got your cup of coffee and you come out and as you breathe and you take your first sip, there it is. What Paul does in this chapter alone, he gives us the panoramic riches that are in Christ in our adoption, in our new citizenship or our new identity in our sanctification, and our strength in times of suffering and in weakness. And then he talks about how we have a final destination or destiny that is in Christ. And so, Tay, I wrap all that up. What are you trying to say? I'll wrap that up in this, in this, one, in this one sentence. Is so over the next couple of weeks, here's what I want us to walk away with. It is, in Christ, we have victory over sin, purpose in suffering, hope for the future, and eternal security. All of that is good, but guess what, friends? We only have it in Christ. Paul writes through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit about now our emancipated living. What I mean by emancipated living, this is the idea that we are free from legal punishment and actions. That our social disclusion, being on the outside in disgrace, has now brought us in and we are free. What Paul has now said is that we are liberated to live a life as free people. We are liberated to live a life as free people, not like a mouse trying to get away from a cat when the cat's paws on his tails. Every time we try to run forward, we got this, 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 this boss over us. No, no, no. We've been liberated to run free and live free. Let's see how Paul tells us how to do that or describes that in Romans chapter 8. Pick up with me in verse 1. It reads this, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. 
For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his son, his own son, uh, his own son, excuse me, in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Verse 5, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on things of the spirit. For to set, uh, for to set the mind of flesh is death, but to set to the mind of the spirit is life and peace. Verse 7, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Verse 9, you, you, however, oh, breathe, believer, are not in the flesh, but are in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Verse 11, last verse, for the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. This is the word of the Lord. At this point, the greatest passage of scripture is now revealed to us of being in Christ. We have that victory over sin, purpose in suffering, hope for the future, and eternal security. What Paul does at the beginning of this letter is super important. He goes back to that word, as I said before, our justification. Is when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, believers in this room, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, what happens at that moment, God then justifies us. Here's a picture of that word. It's a legal word. It's a court word. Court word. If you were in court and you're, you got a great attorney, but also, also the other party has a great attorney, and they have found you guilty, and at that moment, the judge realizes, well, no, you are found guilty, and instead of hitting the gavel and saying you are guilty, he says, you know what? I'm going to take on this punishment and this penalty of this person. The case is like, wait, you can't do that. You are now free. And so you are now considered righteous in a, in a sense because of the decision the judge has made. Fast forward to what that means for us. At this point when we are saved, what Christ does, he makes us righteous before God, although we did not deserve it. And he takes on the penalty, the payment, and the punishment for us. And in God's eyes, that righteousness is now given unto us. Let me just declare that a little more. He declares us righteous. This means that he not only covers our indebtedness, right? Sin is an ugly penalty. You and I have to pay over and over and over again. There's consequences to that, right? But because of our sin was so heavy, so large, it was a debt we could not pay. So he did it for us. He covers our indebtedness. But then also what he does at that moment when we say yes, he deposits righteousness into our account. And that righteousness he deposited into our account has nothing to do with you, has nothing to do with me, has nothing to do with your merit, your status, your money, or your position, but it has to do with his love. At that point, you are now justified because of Christ, and what happens is we now become spiritual millionaires. We now have the freedom to, to live and move for him. And in, in this sense, God declares us righteous just as Christ is because of what he has done for us. And what Romans 8 wants us to understand in my, in my position, it's a declaration of spiritual freedom. It's a freedom that is only found through Jesus Christ. And Paul had to go back to the beginning of justification to get us to kind of this life in the spirit that dwells inside of us. You see, this chapter, it strings together both justification, what Christ has done with us, but then also the work of sanctification, where we're set apart for holiness to be used for his glory and for, for his good and his kingdom, but that's a process. And every day we are striving towards sanctification. Here he strings it together and ties it together. By the end of Romans chapter 8, we're going to then see glorification. 
that someday when, when Christ comes back, he's going to give us a new body and a new mind. We're going to worship him forever, and we'll be able to be with him forever. And so what Paul would often do would go back to the basic truths of justification so that we can understand where we are now in the spirit. Here's what I'm trying to say. One, one commentator put it best this way. He says, one must be assured of acceptance with God before he or she can grow in grace and conformity to Christ. Like you are accepted before God as a believer, as you said, yes, the moment you asked him into your heart to forgive you of your sins, or you acknowledged him as Lord and Savior, you're now justified before the Father. You see, this is fairly important because Paul starts this, this, this chapter out with the word, therefore. This is fairly important why Paul goes here beginning with justification. And of course, like every Bible teacher you've heard, when you see the word therefore, what are you supposed to do? See what it's there for. Now, it goes back, of course, to chapter 5, but then also at the end of chapter 7, here's what Paul says. Paul talks about how the law was good, it could not save him. And then he said, oh, what a wretched man that I am. Who can save me from this body of death? He ties this justification, and now I'm being living, living in the spirit into the immediate preceding text. And the connection he is making here that I am not condemned by my sin. I am not condemned by my failures, my shortcomings, my, my, my falls. I am not condemned because the law tells me I cannot keep all of these standards. I'm condemned. And what should come to me is death. But wait a minute. You tell me there is life. And so what Paul does, he kind of takes uh, this condemnation and he takes justification. And if justification and condemnation was in the octagon, fight MMA style, <laughs> justification takes condemnation and puts it in a headlock and flips it around and makes it tap out and it's now a loser. <laughs> or you think about it this way. You remember the classic game as you were growing up of dodgeball? Any dodgeball champs in the room when you were little? Come on, celebrate it. Yeah. I mean, you had the arm, you had the throw, you knew where to squish it, where to let it go. I mean, think, think, think about the game of dodgeball. This classic game of dodgeball as you're playing, at one point you got two enemy lines, and, and there on that line you have all the balls. And you know the objection, uh, the, the object of the game is to get, get hit or hit the other team and, and survive. Well, at this point, you, you say go, and all the balls begin to move, and you're ducking, and you're dodging, and you're, you're sliding, and you think you're going to make it. But at that moment, before you know it, all the balls begin to hit you. And when it hits you, the, the game is you are out. And so you get out, and your buddies get out, and you're like, man, I had that. Like, I caught it, but then it fell on my hand. And you make all type of excuses. And what happens is, as you continue to go through this game, not only are you out, but others begin to get out. And they begin to drop off and get to the sideline or, or to the stage. <laughs> and you are, are hopeless. You're getting frustrated. Man, I, I thought I had it. I thought I could win this fight again of a hockey illustration. And you go to this place called jail. And the other team begins to win. And, and, and it gets fewer and fewer and fewer and fewer until you hear those famous words. What are they? jailbreak and everyone gets back in the game and the balls get flying and the opposite team is so upset because they worked so hard to get you out and now you are released to go back in to play the game what Paul does at the beginning of this he makes it very clear for those of us who are in Christ Zero condemnation is upon you, and now you can live. You are now free to get back in the game because of the status of justification that Christ has given to us. Here's what Paul's trying to say is that the enslaving power of sin and the freedom that comes from it is only and solely achieved by Jesus Christ. Amen. What do you mean, uh, uh, John chapter 8? Verse 34 to 36 says this, Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. 
The sun remains forever. And then that famous uh, a verse in 36, so if the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. You are free to have that jailbreak, to continue to move across. My fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, have you claimed the wonderful freedoms found in Christ? Are you claiming those wonderful freedoms that only Jesus offers? He talks about this freedom and now the redeeming work that the Spirit would does, does in the believer's lives. And he has broken the dominion of sin and now the reign of godliness can begin or can be assured. Or maybe to the unbeliever, if there's any in the room or watching online after hearing this truth that, wait a minute, I, as I acknowledge my sin and my failure before the Lord, he is going to welcome me into his family. The answer is yes. Are you ready to receive these freedoms that come with being in Christ? So he talks, and I'm going to quickly go through this passage. Uh, he, he talks in about this, 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 this spirit. Verse 2, for the law of the Spirit. At this point, Paul is referring to this is the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. And guess what? It's pretty regular. Like it's going to continue to, to enlighten our eyes, to illuminate us to the things that honor and please God. It's pretty regular that's going on. This is the, the law of the Spirit of life. And from verses 1 through 17 in this chapter, Paul mentions this word spirit 15 times alone, meaning he's trying to get this point across that it is the spirit that is going to work in the believers to give us life, no longer now in the flesh. Meaning in summary, this isn't just kind of this flick of a switch we make or our own individual efforts. Oh, no, we can't we can't change ourselves. But it's because of justification by faith, which we believers of every age have now been rescued from condemnation. And Paul, again, he feeds off this verse and he goes back. He says, if you remember, the law continuously makes demands and demands and demands that you and I can't feel. We just can't do it. And so we try and try again and we see how broken we are in our sin all over again. And it condemns us more. And when those demands are not met, what is given to us? death. And so the law required an action. Because we could not fulfill the law, the law required an action, and it was personal to God. So what did God do? Look at, look at uh, end of uh, verse 3. What did God do to the law that required action? Oh, man, this is good. By sending his son. And watch this next phrase, because it's pretty critical. In the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. At this point, what God does, he sends his son. And this mission of sending his son could not go to anyone else or to anyone less but to Christ. He sends his son. And what freedoms do, do, do we gain when he does that? That he knows us. Because watch the critical word that's used in the text, and it's been debated for centuries, as well as from translation to translation, NIV, ESV, uh, NASB. Watch, this, watch this, this key word. By sending his son into the, what's that word? Into the, into the likeness of sinful flesh. This is important why he uses this word, for it indicates that Jesus was really a true man. He uses incarnational language here that Jesus was a true man. But although being a true man, he was not a sinful man. Here, this flesh or this body or man is literally flesh and body. For Paul did not say that he was sent in sinful flesh. That would have mean he would have had a sin nature with him and that he could sin. But in the likeness of this, just as he did in Philippians 2, 7, being made in the likeness here at this person, his person is clear. He is fully God. He is fully man, yet with no sin nor sin nature. And what was he going to do was now to be a sin offering. He used a sacrificial language here at the end of that. Sinful man and for sin. What he did then was not to condemn us, but 
clearly he came to condemn the sin. Look, look at the, the next verse, verse uh, end of that verse. He condemned sin in the flesh. Let's dive in that a little more. Uh, jo uh, John Murray, the Scottish theologian, says it best this way. He says, in the same nature, which in all others was dominated and directed by sin, God condemned sin, overthrew his power. Jesus not only blotted out sin's guilt, and he has brought us nigh or in the presence or right with God. He also vanquished. This is the idea where you go into battle, and as you battle, you overcome. He vanquished sin as power and set us free from its enslaving dominion. And this could not have been done except in the flesh. The reason why we celebrate Christmas every time is because our Messiah had come to dwell with us. To save us. This is important to, to now the spirit living inside of us. He goes on to say the battle was joined and the triumph secured in the same flesh, which in us is the seat and the agent of sin. It became the likeness of sinful flesh. So we have no condemnation. That's good news. Like we should jump up and down, twirl around, and then sit back down, but we can't. Like it's good news. Uh, Warren Risby, uh, famous pastor at the Moody Church, Chicago, and, and great pastor, he, he says this. He says, the fact that you are not condemned does not depend on your walk. It depends on your standing. Paul goes back to justification for a reason before we talk about how the spirit lives inside of us. Not because you, you put on your Sunday best and you're a good Christian on the weekend, or after you read your quiet time, you kind of got this, the, the, the strength to, to go and conquer the wor world, or you take your Christian uh, 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 drink in the morning, and there the sin is bought it out. No, 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 it has nothing to do with your walk. It has to do with your standing at this point, is that you are justified, declared righteous. But now we play that out. And so what Paul does in the next four, four to eight verses, what he does is he made this contrast, as I read it before, between two type of people. One, a uh, unregenerate person and then a regenerate person. Let me tell you what that word means. Unregenerate is this. This is the person's life that is dominated by the flesh. This is the sinful nature over and over again where, where it is controlling and where the regenerated person. This is the person now where the Holy Spirit has come into your life as a believer has now taken you over where the influence of our sin nature is still there, but we are released from the power of that Two distinctions he make here in this text is this. He says this, the work of Christ for us and the person of Christ in us. The work of Christ for us and the person of Christ in us. What do you mean, Tay? Well, the work of Christ is this. The work of Christ is a status that is grounded at the cross. Where the work of Christ was that he would come in the likeness of sinful man. He would die. He would take on our shame and our guilt and our sins, and then he would die and, and, and raise again. This is Christ for us, that we are justified, not condemned. And then on the other side of this, this is the person of Christ. This is a life lived in union with Christ, where it is Christ in us. This is life in the spirit and not life in the flesh. What happens is he being Jesus Fulfill the law for us because the law, remember, required what? An action. He fulfilled the law for us. Therefore, we can begin to fulfill the law in him by doing two things, walking in, by doing two things, either walking in the flesh or walking in the spirit. Look, look at the end here of verse five. For those who live according to the flesh, set their flesh, set their minds on the things according to the flesh. For those who live according to the spirit, Set their minds on things of the spirit, for to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set your mind on the spirit is life and peace. Oh, man, this is so good. So Paul now at the end, I'm closing soon. Give me about 13, 17, 25 more minutes. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Give me, give me about five minutes. <laughs> at this point, Paul says we must choose how to walk. 
And in choosing how to walk, there's two ways. He says, when you walk in the flesh, this means this is unconverted. This has not been conver uh, converged yet by, by submitting to the Lord. And what he says is when we walk in the flesh, he talks about this thing called the mind. He says, when we do that, the mind sits at the control panel of our lives. The mind does. It sits control center while our whole being is being operated by the flesh. But now, he says, if you've been regenerated, he says, if you are going to be regenerated, then the spirit, which now sits at the control panel of your life, with your whole being, with your mind, has now been invaded by the Holy Spirit. And therefore, you have life and you have peace. As you remember from the beginning of time in the garden where our sin was right before God and uh, 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 strife was with God. Struggle was with God. And we've seen earlier in Romans that now we have peace with God. Let's develop this a little more and then I'll close. He said that the mind of the flesh is a couple things. This is at the end of uh, verse 7. He said that the mind of the flesh is one that's hostile to God. Like, don't understand it. Agitate it. Annoy. Fighting. I mean, want to have a hockey match every time. It's hostile to God because it's idol worship rather than to God, capital G. Hostile to God is because there's little other Gs in our life. Why do you think sometimes, believers, when we are fighting with sin and temptation, we get so frustrated and we feel the, the heaviness of, oh, I want to give this up. And we have this fight in between us. Yeah, because that sin, that flesh is hostile to God. It wants us to submit to that lowercase g or to that temptation or to that sin. He said it's hostile to God. Number two, it does not submit. But as a matter of fact, it's pretty rebellious against what God wants. And then finally, you cannot please God, because as we heard time and time again, it's impossible to please God without what? Faith. Without faith. It does not submit to him being Lord and Savior, but the mindset of the Spirit. I love this as he tries to drive home again. If you, if you are going to live as you are a believer, when you say yes, the believer now takes residence inside of you. And guess what? The believer only lives inside of saved people. As you live, as you say yes to him, the Holy Spirit now comes in and he illuminates your path. That's the verse 9 to the end. You, however, who are not of the flesh but live according to the Spirit, what does the mind of the Spirit do? The mind of the Spirit at your core. You have different thought patterns than you do life in the flesh. With only help by the Holy Spirit, of course, we're not free from sin, but we will stri strive ultimately to do what the Spirit wants. What's at the center council of our hearts, of our lives, is the Holy Spirit. Telling us when we get too close to the fire, oh, you shouldn't do that. Oh, you knew that, didn't, that wasn't right. Oh, as you get into Scripture or as you're praying, the Spirit begins to talk to you and reveal things to you. And the mindset of experience, the, the, the Holy Spirit it goes back to what Paul has said all over again. Grace. Like the opportunity to have the Holy Spirit live inside of us, it is only because of grace. A gift. A gift that you and I did not deserve, but he has now given us life and peace because of grace. And so there is now freedom, friends. There is now freedom available to the believer's life through the operation of the Spirit. Meaning if you would go for surgery tomorrow to remove something that's damaging to your life, they would remove it and put you on a path. At this point, the thing that keeping us living and walking in him is now the Holy Spirit residing in us to look more like him every single day. Donnie Matthews, he writes for the Gospel Coalition. He says this. He says that the Spirit is not just providing eternal life to the believer in the future, but it's also providing a life of flourishing now. The Christian life is characterized not just by the absence of hostility towards God, but also by a restored relationship with God. Paul drops the work of the Holy Spirit 
apply unto salvation through justification through Jesus Christ alone. So, Tay, is the question you're asking, right? Yes. What, what does the life in the Spirit require of me? Well, what does life in the Spirit require of me? Let me give you three things. Number one, it believes, I believe, it's a confidence that God will keep us and empower us to live faithfully for him. This is the idea that you stand flat-footed on your placement in Christ, your new status, your new identity, and your future home, that you stand flat-footed, that you, sec- that you don't second de- uh, doubt, that you don't second guess, that you don't let anything get into your way, that you are confident, you are sure, you are positive because of what Christ has done for you. He will keep you and empower you. How do you know that, Tay? It sounds like you're making it up. Go back to the text. He says, because the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, guess what? Now lives inside of you and I. And so we can have confidence to know that that power ain't weak. That power didn't skip leg day and ain't going to get weak. (laughs) That power don't need no more creatine. That that same power lives inside of us. So we got to have confidence. He will keep us and he will empower us to live faithfully for him. him. Number two is have a mindset that glorifies Christ. And how do you have a mindset that glorifies Christ? Is we make the choice. It's a decision, beloved, that we got to make the choice to live for him. We are either going to live for him or we're going to live against him. And what Paul kept doing in these first 11 verses is talking about this choice of living in the flesh or this choice of living in the spirit. And now as a believer, of course, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit pushes us more to live for him. But it has to be a mindset. And so will you make the choice to live for him and glorify him in all you do? And no, it won't come easy. And no, the road will get hard. And yes, you will endure suffering. And yes, you'll probably be ridiculed. Unless you might feel like you're alone, but you're never alone. And so make the choice. Make the right choice. And then third and finally is this. You commit to surrendering and pursuing fellowship with Christ. You commit to surrendering and and pursuing fellowship with Christ. I've been married for Samantha with almost 10 years. I cannot go in my home and say, hey, I want to get to know you just by looking at you. No, what it takes is going to take me to get to know her. Taking her out on dates. Expensive dates, but taking our own dates. (laughs) Having coffee. Having conversation around the table. Praying at night. Right? You you take that little that little relationship to the relationship we have with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. As I told us last week, when we pray, we have full permission to pray to God the Holy Spirit. I need your help too. God, the Holy Spirit, would you open up my eyes to God, the Holy Spirit? I need you to draw near and give me comfort and peace and enlighten the path. But that has to be because you've got to make a commitment to pursue that. I'm pursuing my bride. But then the idea of fellowship. This is the idea of fellowship that you do with joy and jubilation. Not not that you go to the Father like he's getting ready to hit you again. No, 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 no. This is with great joy of fellowship, pursuing the Holy Spirit. This is what the law for the Spirit requires of us. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Thank you, Father, for years ago, how you spoke through ordinary men and women to be conduits of your word and grace, to share in this word that we now get to make relevant in our lives today. It brings challenge. It equips us. It brings conviction. But ultimately, it brings a great sense of joy and gratitude of your great love for your people. This is the greatest love story, love letter ever been written through us because of what Jesus Christ has done. But on the other side of that, Lord, have we seen our, our, our self, our flesh, our culture, It gets in the way of living for you. And so, Holy Spirit, guide us right now. Not that you need permission, but, Lord, you have full permission 
to strip away the things of our lives that are, that are not good, that are not kind, that are not holy, that are not God-honoring. Take it away. And then fill those voids. Fill those lowercase gods with greater joy found in Christ. Community, prayer, worship, fellowship. We want to see you and know you all the more. And Lord, to lighten up our lives, lighten up our paths like, like a runway at O'Hare of every, every step is guided by you. We trust you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We close now with an old hymn, um, Because He Lives, that, that just proclaims uh, the hope that we have, the confidence that we have in Him. So let's stand as we close together. God sent His Son. They called Him Jesus. He came to love. Heal and forgive. He bled and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all oh, fear is. God, we proclaim that this morning. We thank you for the hope that you give us in Jesus. And we pray as we go from this place, Lord, we would leave in hope that you have given us. You would walk before us this week and that you would call us to yourself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great week. We will see you next Sunday.